Test. There we go. Good morning, Flag Church. I want to welcome you, whether you're in person or online. And I just want to encourage you to stand to your feet as we go into a time of worship. shadow you won't light up the mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me there's no shadow you won't light up the mountain you won't climb up coming after me no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me.
Father, that you would receive glory this morning, that this morning is all about you, God. It is all about being in your presence, experiencing you, being close to you, growing near to you, Father, and that you would receive blessing from our praise this morning. We celebrate you, we praise you for all of, all of what you are and all of what you do, Jesus. We, we just bless your name. We bless you, Jesus. Well, this morning, uh, as we're, we're praising the name of Jesus, we want to praise and give glory uh, to the Lord for, for what he's doing in our church. Um, and this past Tuesday at Counterculture, we had two first-time salvations. For the first time, two college students chose to follow Jesus. And we're celebrating and praising Jesus because it's through him that all of that happens. Uh, but we also want to praise and just celebrate Black Church because of your giving, because of the way that you worship the Lord in your giving. We have an area that is possible, that is dedicated to college students to worship and seek after the Lord um, so that they can grow in their relationship with the Lord, not only on Sundays, but a, a time that's dedicated for them to build relationships with other college students. So we thank you, Black Church, for worshiping the Lord in multitude of areas and giving being one of them. And uh, this morning as we dive into worship more, I just encourage you guys to go deep, seek the Lord, praise him, give him honor, give him the glory that he's deserving of, because it's, a, it's an exciting time to worship the Lord. Jesus is doing things, and so this morning we just get to have an awesome party in the house of the Lord and celebrate and give him glory and praise and honor that he's deserving of. So let's worship this morning. Uh, and let's worship with the heart that is dedicated in blessing the Lord the way that he blesses us. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessing Jesus, you don't owe me more than anything that 
you can do I just want you I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions I'm sorry and I just sing another song Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm sorry When I've come with my agenda I'm sorry when I forgot that you're enough, take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you don't owe me. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. I'm not here for blessing. Oh, I here for blessing. Jesus, you don't owe me anything, more than anything that you can do. I just want you. I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, Jesus, nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just want you. And nothing else. And nothing else, Jesus. Nothing else will do. I'm caught up in your presence I 
just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessings. just want you. Hallelujah. Lord, that's our prayer. That's really what we desire this morning. Just you, your presence, your presence. God, when you're present, everything changes. Lord, we come before you this morning. We are repentant, Lord, for those times when we've forgotten. We've forgotten who you are. We've forgotten your presence in our lives. God, we've We've wandered and, and allowed our minds uh, to stray. God, we ask this morning, you would just renew a sense of the very presence of God in our lives. Lord, that in everything that we do, everything that we experience, you would be first and foremost. You would be front of mind. You, Lord, would, would be on our hearts. Because we know, Lord, that that kind of a relationship changes us and it advances your kingdom and it changes the lives of others through us. God, that's what we desire. We, we just want to be yours this morning. We thank you for your presence, Lord. We don't take that lightly. We don't take your presence lightly this morning. But we are grateful, God. We're grateful. We're grateful for what, for what you're doing in our community. Lord, we're grateful this morning that the, the COVID numbers are beginning to decrease. And Lord, we recognize that as an answer to prayer and we give you praise and glory for it. We pray, Lord, for those among us who are still battling, still battling COVID, other diseases. God, we ask that you would touch them. We pray for your healing power, your healing virtue to flow uh, through their bodies. We ask God that you would restore we pray for those, Lord, who are maybe struggling in their family situations, that God, uh, uh, you would, would begin to heal relationships and you'd uh, set right those things that maybe have been weak, Lord, that you would establish families today. We pray for those who are battling financial situations. We ask God that you would, you would do a powerful, powerful work. And Lord, you'd remind us again this morning of your presence, your power, your purpose for our lives. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. We thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. Before you're seated, give somebody an air high five or a long distance hug or a wave or something. Tell them hi, and then you may be seated. Wow, it's good to be together, isn't it? We want to welcome everybody, welcome those who are with us online. We appreciate you being here. Uh, today, we're publicly celebrating the addition of new members to our church body. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. We're part of a church that Jesus is still building, and... Uh, it's really exciting to be part of his church. We truly are part of each other. We'll experience all that God has for us as we remain unified and have a unified spirit of love and, and encouragement. In the New Testament, the church is called the ecclesia. I love that name. It means the called out ones. And the term referred to the global church uh, throughout history. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 23 says, uh, calls the church, uh, the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. I love that. I love that. And it includes everybody who's been redeemed, everybody who's named the name of Christ throughout all of history in all places. It's the entire body of Christ. And it's great to be part of that. When you think about it, uh, one of the apostles 
heard from Jesus, and that apostle told somebody, and that somebody told somebody else, and generation after generation after generation, and it finally landed on you and me, that we are part of that lineage of Christ, that people have continued to share that message, the entire body of Christ. But that term ecclesia also in the New Testament meant a local church in a particular city or a, a specific location. And everyone who's received Christ as their savior is automatically joined to the church of the firstborn, the universal church, the global church, if you will. And every Christian who's ever lived or breathed is your brother or sister in Christ. But also as individuals in the New Testament, they chose to affiliate with local churches. Now, I don't know whether they had membership lists specifically, but I know that the pastors and the apostles of those churches uh, knew who those members were. And today, we're receiving officially uh, two new members, Chandler and Chelsea Williams. And Chandler and Chelsea, would you come and join me? And Lori, would you come and join us on the platform? We are so glad to have you guys here. Uh, Chandler and Chelsea have already received Christ as their Savior. Uh, they're already members of the Church of the Firstborn. But today, they're choosing to publicly affiliate with this local church, with Flag Church. Their membership applications have been renewed, reviewed and approved by the official board, and they've come today for public recognition. And therefore, Chandler and Chelsea, we want to present these questions to you before the church. Have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If so, answer yes. And are you seeking to live a life reflecting your love for Christ? If so, answer yes. You're ahead of me. And are you in agreement with the biblical teachings of Flag Church? And do you financially support Flag with your tithes and offerings? And have you found a place of service in this church? Yes. They've been added to the worship team for one thing, which we're really, really grateful for. I'm going to ask you to stand as a congregation. I have to tell you, um, we have fallen in love with Chandler and Chelsea and their three boys. Uh, they are just so much fun. There's so much life. You guys know that already, but, um, but they're great kids. I want to ask you as a church, as we stand together, do you commit to support and encourage Chandler and Chelsea? until we all attain to the unity, of the unity of the faith, knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, as it says in Ephesians, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Do you commit to support and encourage them in all these things? If so, answer, we do. Amen, amen. I'm going to ask you to extend your hands toward Chandler and Chelsea, and let's pray for them. Lord, we thank you so much for the Williams family. We thank you for Chandler, for Chelsea, for the boys, for Holland, for Avian, for Mylan Ace. We ask God your blessing upon them. We thank you, Lord, for the gift that they are to us as members of this body. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless our relationship together as, as the church and with them as members here. And Lord, that there would continue to be unity, but Lord, even beyond that, that that unity would, would cause the kingdom of God to advance here in Pittsburgh and in the surrounding area, the surrounding communities. So God, we commit our relationship to you. We thank you, Lord, that you've called us to be the called out ones. We're grateful, Lord, not only that you've called us to that, but that you've called us to that together. We love you, Jesus, and we're grateful, Lord, for Chandler and Chelsea and their boys. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And we got to get a picture, right? Okay. You may be seated. <laughs> I hope you got my good side. Okay. Very good. Thanks so much, you guys. We love you. Wow, that's fun. If you have not met Chandler and Chelsea, be sure that you do uh, meet up with them after church. They're incredible people. It's fun to be the church, isn't it? It's just good. You can nod or say yes or say amen or oh my or whatever. What, yeah. So before we get started today, uh, I have a little assignment. Now, we don't, we don't do homework assignments between services, but we have a little assignment, uh, a, some prep work this morning that we're going to do right here in-house. 
I want you to think back over your lifetime and think about the time that God has seemed closest to you. Somebody came to me after church and said, hey, it's not really fair to say a time because there's been several times. Well, okay, think about some of those times, but get a specific time when God seemed closest to you. It might have been, uh, you know, we, we asked this question in the early service and we uh, asked the worship team before we started this morning um, to share, and we just had time for a couple of them to, to share, but one individual talked about a time when, when uh, he was uh, in a, a place where he was away, he could focus his attention, uh, be quiet, and he sensed God calling his name. Just a powerful, powerful experience. Another individual said uh, he was closest to God at a time when it was one of the darkest times of his life. And maybe that's true for you, one of those. Maybe it's a time when God has challenged you. But think about a time, because I, I really want us to get this set in our minds, uh, a time when God has seemed closest to you. If you're joining us online, I'd, in, I'd invite you to uh, join with us in this process. And even uh, in the chat portion of, of the online experience, just share maybe uh, a few words of what that time might have been. And just even if, if you'd like to, you could write it down uh, this morning. If you're here present, you could uh, put it into your phone, whatever it might be. Just a few words, because I, I want us to get, get in our minds that time. And we'll come back and use that in just a minute. Got it? Just nod your heads. Okay, we'll go on. Uh, when Lori, uh, when our son was in high school, Lori and I discovered that we love track and field. Uh, not to participate in it, but to watch it. We, we love watching track and field. Our son was involved in it, and, and uh, we just fell in love with the experience. And, and I had not competed in any kind of track and field in high school or any of my history. But there was something about the purity of the competition in track and field, especially in races, where, where you're, you're competing with the person next to you, but, but you're also competing with yourself. You're uh, working toward your own personal record. You, you uh, uh, may be competing uh, really against your school record or the conference record or national or even uh, world record. Lori and I have been privileged to be at track meets where we watched people set, set world records. And, and what, just what an incredible, incredible experience. And, and uh, uh, maybe one of the things that you can compete for if you're participating in track and field is the track record that you can uh, post the fastest time or throw the furthest distance for that specific track, and, and many tracks will have their track records on, on uh, uh, boards where you can see who's, who's had the fastest time on, on this track, and, and we call that the track record, but the words track record also have another meaning. They can mean the, uh, I looked this up, uh, there's a definition of track record that which is the past achievements or performance of a person or an organization or a product, so we might refer to an athlete's uh, track record record as, as maybe we say we, we have, they have a great track record for uh, consistent performance or uh, their track record in this specific area isn't that good or, or it's inconsistent or whatever the case might be. But it can re refer to other things. Maybe uh, a person might have a track record for forgetting appointments. Is there anybody who can testify to, uh, you might have that track record. Um, maybe uh, somebody has a track record for bringing home lost kittens. It's just what they do. If, if I did that, number one, I would sneeze myself all the way probably to heaven, and I'd probably do that in the backyard because the kitten and I would be in the backyard. But maybe you have a track record. All of us really have track records, and the Israelites in the Old Testament had a habit of recalling God's track record. Oftentimes, God would remind them of his track record. If they were renewing a covenant or an agreement that they had, and God was saying, hey, this is how I want you to live, and he would refer back to his track record. When God was calling Israel to step out in faith, he'd refer back to his track record. And the Israelites, when they were encouraging each other, they would refer back to God's track record, what he had done in the past. And this morning, what I'd like to do is to look at some verses in the Bible that talk about God's 
track record, that talk about God's track record. And I think we'll find some similarities to God's track record in our own lives. Those, those times that we just mentioned, that we can remember God seeming to be closest to us. As we're in this series titled, When God Seems Distant, I think it's healthy for us from time to time to remember those times when God seemed closest. So in order to really look at that and to look at Israel's history of referring to God's track record, I, I want to get a, a bit of a running start on a story. You may be familiar with this story, you may not, but there was a time in Israel's history when they were subject to Egyptian slavery for 400 years, actually a little more than 400 years, but just round figures, about 400 years. And the way that it started was that Jacob had 12 sons. One of his sons was Joseph, and maybe you're familiar with the story. We're going to unpack it uh, uh, to a great extent a little later this year. Uh, we've got a plan to look at the life of Joseph, and I'm really excited for it. But long story short, Joseph uh, ended up as second in command in Egypt while the rest of his family was still in Canaan, the land that became the promised land. So uh, since Joseph was in Egypt and Egypt had plenty of grain because of Joseph's leadership and Canaan was in a drought, Joseph's brothers came down to get some grain. And what ended up transpiring was that his entire family came and they moved to Egypt and uh, were given grain, they were given land, they were hosted in Egypt. Well, fast forward over 400 years, they became a great nation there in, in Egypt, the Israelites, but they came under Egyptian bondage. They were slaves in Egypt. And so they, again, we fast forward and Moses is raised up out of the Israelites and and uh, maybe you know the story of Moses, burning bush. Anybody with me? There was a, a burning bush. He's wandering in the wilderness. He's shepherding sheep. He's, he's out in the, the wasteland, and a, he sees a bush that's burning, but it's not consumed. And he turns aside to look at it, and he approaches the bush, and he hears the voice of God from the bush. And the voice of God says, take your shoes off. This is holy ground. And, and then God speaks to Moses out of that burning bush, and he says, I want you to go back, and I want you to deliver my people, Israel, out of Egypt. And so Moses goes back, and again, if you're familiar with the story, uh, Pharaoh is the leader in Egypt, and Pharaoh is not happy about letting his Egyptian uh, or his Israelite slave population exit Egypt. And so uh, he has, uh, uh, the Bible calls it a stiff neck, and he refuses to let them leave. And there's a series of 12 plagues. The final plague is that the firstborn of everybody in Egypt dies, their, their livestock, their children. Uh, the firstborn in every household uh, passes away. The Israelites are spared from that. And that's the turning point, the final plague, that finally Pharaoh says, I want you to go. And not only does he say, I want you to go, he says, you can take whatever you want. And so Israel leaves Egypt with this uh, all of, of, of this contraband, if you will, that's been given to them. It's almost like they had gone in and conquered Egypt, but they've actually just been released from slavery and given all of these items, and they head out into the wilderness. And Pharaoh, who probably was a little bit on the crazy side, has a change of heart again. And he says, we're going to pursue the Israelites. I can't believe I let them go. And he begins pursuing them with all of his army. And the Israelites come to the Red Sea. Anybody with me you, you following? So the Israelites come to the Red Sea. They can't cross the Red Sea. Uh, they're, they're on the, the shore of the sea, and they look over their shoulders, and they see Pharaoh and his army coming down upon them, and they don't know what to do. They're in this place where they, there's no human way out. And God speaks to Moses, and he says, take your take your rod, he had a rod that he walked with, a, a staff, so to speak, and, and he said, take your staff and, and stretch it out over the Red Sea, and Moses does that, and the Red Sea actually parts before them, and the ground in front of them becomes dry, and all of Israel crosses, well over a million people, crosses the Red Sea and gets to the other side, and Pharaoh decides he's going to pursue them right through the Red Sea, the, the land is dry, he begins to pursue them. The Red Sea crashes down, collapses on top of them, and kills all of them. And Israel has a miracle 
deliverance. And after that, throughout all of Israel's history, they looked back at that miracle deliverance. All they would have to say to each other is, remember the Red Sea. And it changed their perspective. Sometimes when God seems distant, I think we need to do the same thing. We need to look back at that time when God was closest to us and remember his faithfulness to us. We need to remember and review God's track record in our lives. I want to take a look this morning at some scriptures where Israel reviews God's track record in their history. And they see that one experience of, of deliverance emboldening their faith in so many other situations. For instance, when Israel was tempted to fear, they remembered God's deliverance. Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 1, it's a, an interesting verse. Uh, God's speaking to the Israelites and he says, when you go out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, and I can just imagine that the people of, of Israel are, are remembering, looking over their shoulder and seeing that exact thing happen, uh, an army and chariots and horses and people more numerous than them. He says, when that happens, when you go into battle, don't be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, and here it is, who brought you up from the land of Egypt is with you. God's saying, listen, when you go into battle, don't be afraid. Why? Because God has this track record of delivering you from the Egyptians. Let me ask you today, what, what are you fearing? Maybe there's something in your life that, that you fear. It, it seems like in our culture, in the nation, especially through 2020, that that anxiety is on the rise, that there's more and more panic, more and more fear that we're experiencing as, as a culture. Maybe you've experienced some of that. Maybe, maybe you're frightened because of some health issues today. Maybe you're concerned or frightened about financial issues. I know that the pandemic has, has affected a number of us in, in, in uh, employment and financially. Maybe you're frightened because of some family issues, relationship issues. And if you're battling fear today, just as the Israelites were often battled fear when, when God would call them to do something they knew they didn't have the ability to do, Maybe you're facing those same kinds of fears, and I would encourage us to do exactly what the Israelites did and look back to that time. Remember the time that you just noted a little bit ago when God was closest to you, when God was faithful, when it was something that you couldn't handle, but God came in, God stepped in, and God handled it for you. Remember that time. Remember the time when God was closest to you, because I will guarantee you that God, if he was faithful then, will be faithful again Today, whatever it is that you're fearing, God's got you. When Israel not only faced fear, but when they faced a challenge, they remembered God's deliverance. Jeremiah chapter 11, the prophets, uh, I'm, I'm reading through the Old Testament right now, and, and I'm in the middle of the prophets, and uh, oh my word, uh, sometimes you just have to kind of come up for air because it gets a little depressing, but... but just giving you some context, Jeremiah, God's speaking to him, and he, Jer, God says to Jeremiah, say to them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Again, it's the prophet, uh, cursed is the one who does not obey the words of this covenant, which I commanded your forefathers, here it is, on the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, from the iron furnace, he, God calls their bondage the iron furnace several times in the Old Testament saying, listen to my voice, and, and here it is, and do, a, do according to all that I command you, so you shall be my people and I will be your God. What God was doing was he was challenging Israel to do everything that he had told them to do. And it was a long list, and God, 
God didn't let them off easily. They were challenged in so many different areas. And maybe you're facing a challenge like that where you believe that God's calling you to do something, but, but you know that you don't have the ability or the power to do it. I believe that God's calling us today to stand in faith. Maybe standing in faith for you is just uh, choosing the high road with that person at work that makes you crazy. (laughs) But it's standing in faith. It's doing the right thing in the midst of a difficult situation. Why? Because God has been faithful in the past and he'll be faithful to do in the future what he's done in the past. Listen, God has a plan. This is so important. God has a plan for you. And he's working in you to produce the person that God intended you to be from the beginning. God is working his plan in you. And he's worked in your life before so that you would have faith to watch him and pursue him working in your life right now. Some, somebody says, you know, I, I, I don't know that, that God's really got a plan for me. Listen, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul's writing to the Philippian church, and he says this, for I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work among you will complete it by the day of Christ Jesus. What's he saying? God has a plan for you. God's working his plan, and God's going to complete his plan for you, even if he's challenging you to do something that's impossible. Remember the Israelites, God challenged them, go across the Red Sea. How am I going to do that? Go ahead and and cross the Red Sea. There's no way possible that I can do that. It's beyond my ability. Maybe you're facing something right now where you're saying, this is beyond my ability. I don't have the ability to, to save this marriage. I don't have the ability to heal myself. I don't have the ability to deal with the people that are, that are making my life insane. I don't have that ability. And God says, yeah, that's exactly where I want you. Because I have the ability. And I just want to challenge us this morning. Remember when God was closest to us. Because God will help you to accomplish everything that he's called you to do. He'll help you to accomplish everything that he's called you to do. Maybe this morning you're facing a fear. Maybe you're facing a challenge. Maybe you're facing a debilitating habit or a mindset or an addiction. So we look at Israel's history, one of the things that keeps popping up is that the people of Israel kept forgetting their identity. They forgot that they weren't slaves any longer. In fact, after they crossed the Red Sea, they wandered through the wilderness. They wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. It was a a trip that should have taken them two weeks, and it it took them 40 years because God kept having them... uh, circle the mountains and and walk through the wilderness and and God was trying to teach them things in those 40 years and they weren't learning very well. One of the things that happened early on in in that experience is that the Israelites became hungry and they came to Moses and rather than simply saying, we're hungry, we need some food, they came to Moses and they said, so you take us out of Egypt to kill us in the wilderness. Great. Great. And then they said something that's absolutely amazing. They said, I wish that we were back in Egypt. Back in Egypt where they were forced to make bricks, to build buildings for the Egyptians. And when the plague started to happen, Pharaoh got so angry, he said, now they have to collect the straw as well as make the bricks and we're not lowering the the, the number of bricks that are required to be made in their life was miserable. They were abused. They were abused physically. They were abused emotionally. They were abused verbally. They were taken advantage of in every way that you can imagine being taken advantage of. And here they are in the wilderness. They found their freedom. And the first time that they get hungry, they say to, to Moses, you know what? We were made to be slaves. And some of us are tempted to do that same thing also to forget that, that we serve a God of incredible power, but their, de- their default mindset was slavery and dependence and poverty. That was the default mindset that they, that they went to. Maybe you can relate to that idea of a default mindset. 
God had to remind Israel of God's identity and of Israel's identity. In Leviticus chapter 26, we read, Moreover, God speaking, I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul will not reject you. I will also walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt so that you would not be their slaves. And I love what he says here. And I broke your yoke and made you walk erect, made you walk upright. Sometimes when God seems distant, I think it's important that we remember when he seemed closest to us. And as he did for Israel, he'll do for us. He'll remind us of who we are. He'll break the yoke of our slavery. Maybe you're facing a habit or an addiction. I I, want to encourage you. Remember when God has helped you before. He can help you to break that yoke that's burdening you right now. Whatever it is, don't believe the lies of the enemy. Let me ask you this morning, do you carry the wrong self-image? Do you see yourself as a failure? Or as poor? Or as less qualified? Or less attractive? I love it when God speaks to Israel and he says, you know what, I broke the bars of your yoke. I made you walk upright. I made you walk erect. This is what I'd encourage you this morning. Stop listening to the lies of the enemy and allow God to make you upright. Allow God to set you on his path. Listen, you don't take a backseat to anybody when it comes to the love and purpose and plan of God for your life. Maybe you're struggling today and you feel unloved and and that's kind of the default mindset that you slip back into. I love that God reminded the Israelites in Leviticus chapter 26, we just read it, verse 12. He says, I also walk among you. I will also walk among you and be your God and you shall be my people. God really has made you his possession. You can find it in the Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation. God keeps repeating this theme over and over and over again. I'll be your God and you'll be my people. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. What's he saying? He's saying, you know what? I love you. Jeremiah quoted God and said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. God's love for you will never end. God has a purpose for you and he's working his purpose in you. And when you doubt that he's working his purpose in you, look back on your history with God and recognize again, just like the Israelites when they crossed the Red Sea, God has worked in your life in ways that he wants you to look back at and recognize that God is still alive, he's still at work, and he's still able in your situation. Maybe somebody this morning is saying, well, all that's great, but looking back at what God's done before, that's wonderful, except that I've never faced this challenge before. Whatever the challenge is that you're facing, this is a new one. I've, I've never seen God do this kind of thing in my life before. But that's just the point, because God's faithfulness is transferable. Let me say that again. God's faithfulness is transferable. We see it with Israel. They crossed the Red Sea. They wandered through the wilderness for the 40 years. Uh, Everybody had died except for two people, Joshua and Caleb. Joshua was now in charge. Moses had passed away. And they came to the Jordan River. The Jordan River's in flood stage. They're supposed to cross the Jordan from the east side over to the west side into the promised land. It's like the last leg of the journey. And uh, they come to the Jordan River and they are out of resources. They don't have a bridge. They don't have a boat. They don't have a barge to get them across. They are stuck. Joshua says, God, what should we do? And God speaks to him and he says, have the priest just walk down into the water. And I'm sure 
that Joshua and Caleb were looking back at the history that they'd experienced and all the other Israelites had heard the stories of crossing the Red Sea and they looked at it and they said, well, the God who, who uh, moved back the, the Red Sea certainly will be able to stop the Jordan River. It was a, uh, the same miracle, just a different location. But when Israel faced conquering the promised land and God said, you know what, it's time for you to go in. It's time for you to take over the promised land. Israel had never experienced that before. They'd never experienced war. All they had experienced was wandering for an entire generation. They didn't know what a battle even looked like. But they looked back to the Red Sea and they said, you know what? The miracle looks different, but the God is still the same. Because God's faithfulness is transferable. When Israel was conquered and, and they felt hopeless and, and they went into exile, they looked back and they remembered their deliverance from Egypt and crossing the Red Sea and they said, different miracle same God. His faithfulness is transferable. When it was time for them to come back to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, they knew that it was an impossible task. Nobody around them wanted, to, wanted them to do it. There were armies all around that were ra waiting to destroy them. They knew that it wasn't within their power to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. But they looked back and they said, there's a God in heaven who delivered us from Egypt and helped us to cross the Red Sea different miracle, same God. And maybe this morning you're facing something you've never faced before. I want to encourage you. The God who was faithful to you before will continue to be faithful to you. Whether it's fear, whether it's a challenge, whether it's an addiction or a habit or a mindset, different miracle same God. His faithfulness is transferable. Listen, this morning, you are God's possession. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. He's delivered you. He's equipped you. And he's called you his own. Whatever you're facing today, God's got it. He's got it. Would you stand with me? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your presence with us today. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the history that, <laughs> that we have personally and that we share with your people. Lord, time after time after time, you've been faithful in our lives. Time after time after time, you've been faithful to your church. Time after time after time, you've been faithful to Israel. God, you're a faithful, faithful God. I pray for anyone here or joining us online today that may be struggling with a fear. I pray, God, that your faithfulness would overshadow that fear. Pray for those today, God, who are facing a challenge. Lord, that your faithfulness would overshadow that challenge. I pray for those of us, Lord, who maybe are struggling with that default mindset or that default habit or that default addiction. Lord, those of us that, that see ourselves still in slavery, that, that God, we would look back at our lives, look back at your history and your faithfulness and recognize you, God, as the God who breaks the yoke, causes us to walk upright. <laughs> Lord, change the way that we think, change the way that we see ourselves because of your presence in our lives. with heads bowed and eyes closed. I wonder if there's someone today with us here or maybe watching online who's 
saying, you know, I'm not sure that I've ever really experienced God's faithfulness. I'm not sure I've ever really experienced that relationship with God, but I want to. In fact, if something were to happen to me today, I'm not sure what my eternal destiny would be, but I want to to know that and to have that assurance. I want to know that I'm forgiven. If that's you today, I'm going to ask you to slip up your hand. If you're here, just slip up your hand. And by that, I pray, saying, you're saying, Tom, would you please pray for me? I, I want to know that I'm forgiven. Maybe you're there watching with us online. You don't want to raise your hand maybe, but maybe just place your hand over your heart. If that's your situation, you're asking God to forgive you today and to change your life. And if that's you, I'm going to ask you to, to pray with me. I'm going to ask everybody here to pray in support. If you would just pray this prayer after me, repeat this prayer after me in support of those who may be praying it for the first time. Would you pray, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I turn away from my sin. And I turn toward you. I receive you as my Savior. I give you all of my life all that I am, all that I have, all that I hope to be, I'm yours. I thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for changing me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. If you prayed that prayer, head out to our app, whether you're here in person or you're joining us online, head out to our app and just click, click on the connect uh, tab and we'd love to connect with you and, and uh, help you along in your new faith. I think it'd be appropriate for us just to continue to worship the Lord this morning. Let's worship him and thank him for what he's doing in our lives. Test. So um, we just want to introduce a new song and as we, you know, wrap up this sermon of hearing Pastor Tom talk about how God has brought us through Egypt, whatever you're facing, whatever your Egypt is, God has been faithful to bring us through it, and he is faithful to continue doing so. So we just want to sing a song of thankfulness, of gratefulness, of all that God has brought us through, and it goes like this. You're the God who fights for me, Lord of forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance the exodus of my heart as you found me you freed me held back the waters for my release oh Yahweh sing it with me you're the God who fights for me Lord of every victory, hallelujah, hallelujah. You have torn apart the sea, you have led me through the deep, hallelujah, hallelujah. by day is a sign that you are with me the fire by night is the guiding light to my feet as you found as you found me you freed me held back the waters for my release oh Yahweh you're the God you're the God who fights for me Lord of every victory Hallelujah, hallelujah, you have 
have torn apart the sea. You have led me through the deep. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sing that again. You're the God who fights for me. Lord of chains that have surrounded you and some of you are still walking around with those chains that are broken but you're holding them on you're just letting them stay around you this is the time for you to walk out of those chains walk into the freedom that he has given you already so we're getting ready to sing out right now how he stepped into our egypt and led us to freedom because you stepped into my egypt and you took me by the hand and you marched me out in freedom into the promised land now i will not forget you god how sing of all you've done step is swallowed up forever by the fury of your love because you stepped into my egypt and you took me by the hand and you marched me out in freedom straight into the promised land now i will not forget you god i'll sing of all you've done because death is swallowed up forever by the fury of your love sing this out you're the god you're the god who fights for me lord of every victory hallelujah Woo! hallelujah you have torn you have torn apart the sea you have led me through the deep hallelujah hallelujah you're the god who fights for me lord of every victory hallelujah hallelujah you have torn apart the have led me through the deep hallelujah hallelujah you're the god who fights for me lord of every victory hallelujah hallelujah you have torn apart the sea you have led me through the deep hallelujah Hallelujah. Yes, Lord, we thank Amen. you so much. And we're going to just continue declaring victory. darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Jesus, every war he wages, he will win. 
backing down from any giant, no, cause I know how this story ends, do you know, yes I know. What the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good And you turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good And you turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good Turn it for good. You take, you take, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. And you turn it for good. You take, you take, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. And you turn it for good. One last time. man I challenge you guys go with the thought that the best is yet to come that the best is yet to come that we serve a God that is faithful that we serve a God that is powerful that we can trust and know that his plan is best last week our fusion kids our our, our kids ministry they learned that they walked away with the main point that God's plan is best God's plan God's plan is best it's so easy that they can understand we can understand it too, that as we leave this place, that we can know that God's plan is best, that there is no plan better than his. There is no God that is like our God because there is no other God besides our God. So if he's powerful enough to do anything that we ask, that we can trust that the best is yet to come for this church, for our community, for your life. There is no box that can confine our God so we can trust that he's got a plan for us. 
So Jesus, we thank you. We thank you, Jesus, that you are good, that you are faithful, that you are powerful, and that there is nothing greater than you. Lord, we believe that your hand is upon us, that you are on the throne of our lives, that you are on the throne of our nation, Jesus, and that you will see your kingdom grow, that your kingdom will come. And Jesus, you are going to be the one that is going to be on the top forever, Jesus. You reign forever, Lord, and we celebrate you. We know that you are not done, you are not finished, and we can believe that the best is yet to come. We celebrate you, Jesus. We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, we love you guys. We are so glad that you are here with us this morning, praying that you have a wonderful rest of your Sunday, and we look forward to see you next week. Have a great rest of your Sunday, everyone.